Well, good, e- good morning, everybody. Uh, hey, uh, come on in, let's get, get together and uh, let's all stand. It's good to see you, the 10 o'clockers. Was the traffic a little challenging out there? Just a little, okay, you made it though. That's good, glad you're here. I'm sure people are still rolling in. Hey, uh, you guys ready to worship the Lord this morning? Yeah. Um, This is going to be fun. You know, we have uh, some special guests all the way from Texas and Nashville to come and help us out. You know, we love to do this uh, circle and do some acoustic stuff uh, once in a while. And, uh, you know, we're we're, kind of, you know, uh, beginners when it comes to the bluegrass stuff. But today we got the real deal. Uh, You put uh, some anything with strings in the hands of these three people here and they're going to just tear them up. Uh, And uh, let's just give an Athey Creek welcome for the Purple Holes and Banjo Band. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, we're gonna have fun here today. But um, you know, I love I love bluegrass because it's hard to be depressed when you got a banjo in the room. You know what I mean? I, there's something about the ba- banjo, the mandolin. They're happy instruments. And the Bible says, "Rejoice in the Lord." We have a reason to be joyful. And I've noticed some worship music is so somber, and, and I love that too. But there's something about just being joyful and rejoicing in all the good things the Lord has done. So let's do that. Let's just sing out and uh, let's see what you got. Are you guys ready to roll here? All right, here we go. Oh, I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. Praise the Lord. With a few strings on the wild string. I'm going to sing my Jesus side. I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. divide us up into groups. Are you guys ready to do this? Uh, what we're going to do is uh, Joey is going to lead this section right here. You guys from here over, you guys are all going to be the trains, okay? You guys ready for trains? All right. This group over here, you're going to follow Brooke because you guys look so saintly. We're going to make you the saints, okay? Uh, you're either a saint or you're an ain't, uh, but uh, you guys look like saints. And then the center section, this is the most, uh, the best looking group because I'm the leader and I fit right in with this group. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. This group here, the center group, we're going to be, I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I will hold down the fort, okay? All right. So we're going to sing, I'm going to sing, sing, sing all together, and then we'll go right into our rounds. Everybody sings in their group. All right, here we go. Oh, I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing. I'm going to
Well, a few years ago, I uh, picked up a mandolin and I thought, you know, it'd be a fun instrument to play. So I went on YouTube and looked up, uh, you know, uh, mandolin instructor, you know, tutorial. And I found this guy named Banjo Ben, who teaches banjo, guitar, mandolin. And I went to his website and I thought, oh, this is great. And he even had a bunch of hymns. I thought, the hymns, this is awesome. So I um, started learning some of those, uh, some of those hymns and, uh, on the mandolin. And, uh, and then I thought, man, this, this guy's awesome because he'd give the lesson and then he would talk about the hymns and share the gospel at the end of his lesson. And uh, I thought, this is really cool. And, you know, as a guy who uh, uh, toured around the world, really, all over, he's playing on the Grammys and all, all over stuff, Saturday Night Live, Taylor Swift, all that. But I love that he's just got this love for the Lord and, and his sisters, uh, the, the Purple Holes, man, they've also been all over the world. You guys have played everywhere. And uh, it's just so cool to be able to have you guys here. But um, one of the first lessons I learned from Banjo Ben was a great old hymn called uh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Uh, so Banjo Ben, he taught me this song. Here we go.
Worthy to be praised. So many times words just come short. And I pray that as we sing another song, would you be lifted up? Would you be honored? Would your name be glorified? And just focused on. So we love you, Father. And we lift your name up. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting. We cannot escape Your love will surely come find us Like blazing wildfire
Lord, how thankful we are. You're just so good, Lord. You're so good to us. And we're thankful that we can sing these songs of praise. And um, Lord, uh, again, we just look forward to that day when we stand before your throne singing praise songs around your throne, even as the, the, those creatures around the throne are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Lord, we wanna worship you in this time and, and in this place in your sanctuary. Um, Lord, I pray that the worship wouldn't stop right here. But Lord, as we just continue to worship you, Lord, throughout the rest of the service, through song and through the teaching of your word, may it all just be an act of worship, we pray. So we pray your blessing now and thank you for the rest of this time in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Why don't you have a seat? Make yourself all comfy. Um, well, uh, would you guys like to hear the Purple Holes and Banjo Ben do a little tune? Yeah, yeah let's give a big Athey Creek welcome once again. Well, we are glad to be here this morning. Thank you, Brett, for the introduction. We are a long ways from home. I'm just praying right now for the situation that's happening over here. Father, would you protect her? We are a long way from home, but um, I see signs of home around here. I see a, a Tennessee shirt on. And I see a Texas A&M shirt. I'm an Aggie that lives in Tennessee, so I'm surrounded. It's great. I'd also like to welcome our distinguished fourth member this weekend, Mr. Evan Windsor from Nashville, Tennessee. We are indeed uh, so glad to be here, and thank you for welcoming us. And um, it's just been a joyful time we've had so far. Uh, we're going to play you a tune that uh, Katie and I wrote. It comes out of Philippians 1.6, and I hope it encourages you.
I don't know, I don't know how human fingers could move that fast. Like that's, that's just insane to me. I, I don't even get that. But there's more where that came from tonight. We're gonna have a blast. Uh, little burgers and uh, hot dogs and barbecue up, up at the grass section. Uh, anybody plan on being there tonight? You guys, yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> hey, um, this is gonna be a zoo. There's a, a lot of people coming. Um, so we've got it all figured out, but we have an instructional video for you of how to go to, to the barbecue tonight. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and let me just add this. Um, if you can carpool, that's going to hu hugely help us because the main problem is the parking, of course. Uh, but we've got it uh, figured out. But you really have to watch this if you're coming tonight. So here we go. Let's roll it. Hey, Athey Creek. We are thrilled to welcome you all to our big summer concert featuring the Purple Holes and Banjo Ben. There's nothing better than bluegrass, burgers, and loads of fun for the whole family. It's been a while, so we wanted to give you the lowdown on how the evening will work. First, let's talk about parking. We are expecting a lot of folks, which is bound to be a blast. Because of this, we wanted to let you know that parking will be available both here at Athey Creek and down the road at Rolling Hills Community Church. We'll have several shuttles operating the entire evening, so you'll have a ride to your car whenever you need it. We won't be able to accommodate drop-offs once our lots here at Athey are full, so if you are able to park at Rolling Hills even before our lots are full, that would be a great help to us so we can allow ADA accessibility and families to unload. Feel free to arrive as early as 4.30. Next, let's talk about what to bring and what not to bring. You'll definitely want to bring a lawn chair or blanket for seating on our main lawn. If you have kids coming with you, make sure to bring clothes they can get wet in since we'll have fun water activities available. Be sure to keep an eye on your kids at all times. And finally, you'll want to bring your appetite. Food will be served at 6 o'clock and we'll have plenty of burgers and dogs to go around. Speaking of dogs, as much as we love dogs, we do ask that you leave your pets outside of service animals at home. We are so excited to enjoy this evening of music, good food, and great fellowship. We'll see you soon. My daughter, Brooke, she sounds like one of those flight attendant, you know, uh, like that's really good. She's got a good voice for that. Um, <laughs> um, we have like uh, 10 shuttle buses. So it'll be really like every two, two minutes or every one minute, there'll be a bus coming. It's gonna be great. So don't be afraid to park over there at the Rolling Hills parking lot. That's gonna be great. And uh, you can come and go, you know, as you please. So don't worry about getting locked in here. Uh, it'll be good. So, um, hey, also, don't forget, ladies, there's a uh, women's worship night here this Friday night in the grass area. The, uh, uh, some of the Athey Creek worship team's gonna do some, some worship and there's a, a light meal and just a really good time for the ladies uh, uh, this Friday night, six, uh, six o'clock right here in the grass area. So that's gonna be kind of cool. I guess us, us guys, we don't get to worship the Lord, but... Um. <laughs> Bring a lawn chair or a blanket, uh, you know, and you can grab your ticket on the website if you want to jump in on that. Wednesday night, we're continuing our study through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. We take a text from our upcoming Wednesday study, as we always do here on Sunday. So um, I've got kind of a tricky challenge uh, this morning because we are now officially in Ezekiel chapter 38. <laughs> um, and the question is, does bluegrass and Ezekiel 38 go together? Um, <laughs> well, um, I think so, and I'll, I'll try to tie the loose ends because um, even though this is a fairly dire chapter and kind of a brutal story, uh, the end of the story for the believer is wonderful and glorious and joyful. And so hopefully we'll get to that. But what I'm gonna do uh, th this morning is I'm gonna give you a sort of a high level you know, Gog Magog invasion, Ezekiel 38 prophecy, uh, give a real, you know, Reader's Digest version. But I, I want you to go away from this service kind of saying, okay, I kind of know what the Gog Magog Ezekiel 38 thing is all about. Because it's one of the amazing prophecies of the Bible. And you say, well, all of them are amazing. It is, but this one is interesting and maybe more important because it has to do with you and me and the days we're living. 
many of the Bible prophecies either were things that were foretold that have already happened, like the coming of Christ, the first coming, um, you know, and, and prophecies about Israel and stuff like that. In fact, the first, you know, chapters of Ezekiel's all have been about the Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. But now in chapters uh, 36, 37, 38, 39, these are things that are unfolding, they're happening right now before our eyes, we're seeing some of these events. And what's even more interesting is as we get into chapter 38, we know that these are some of the events that are gonna be in the last days. So as we see the situation sort of, uh, you know, being postured by the Lord, it tells us a little bit about the signs of the times that we're living. So it's important for us to look at this chapter, uh, these two chapters, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because Ezekiel says there's a storm that's a coming. <laughs> he talks about a big storm. What kind of storm is it? Well, uh, we'll get into that. Ezekiel's gonna tell us. By the way, one job that I would never wanna have is a meteorologist or a weatherman on TV. Because have you noticed how many times they're wrong? Like of all the sciences, like, well, tomorrow's gonna be this and that. And then remember that guy, what was his name? Rod something or other. He, he used to give himself a grade the next day, like how I did. And, and, you know, after so many, you know, the next day he's like, okay, I give myself a D. You know, it's like, remember that poor guy? He was always giving himself a bad grade because as it turns out, they have a hard time telling what the weather's gonna be tomorrow. And by the way, I would be more concerned about climate change if I knew that we knew what tomorrow's weather is going to look like, let alone 12 years from now or 100 years from now. Honestly, I, I was like, come on, we can't even tell the weather. So what they do is they try to puff up the weather. Have you ever noticed some of these guys? Check out this guy. I, I love this. I, I want to share it with you guys. The, the, um, the guy during Hurricane Florence, uh, this weather guy was out there. They always put the poor guy out there in the, in the wind and stuff. But this guy, check it out. He's, he's sort of fighting the wind, barely able to stand up. Look at that, barely able to, but look at the teenagers in the background. They're like, eh. um, they're just, they're on a little afternoon stroll, you know. <laughs> but this guy, this guy's a whole oh, huge storm. You gotta get out of your house, run for your life, you know. Uh, anyway, enough of that. This guy here, uh, Robert Ricks, uh, interesting guy. Nobody knows who he is, but they should. Because while everybody was saying, yeah, Hurricane Katrina will be a problem and it's gonna be a very bad hurricane, all this, this guy was saying, no, 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 no. This is gonna be a horrible hurricane. The document on the left there is the actual uh, picture of the, of the document that he sent from the National Weather Service. Um, he sent it in a message at 10 a.m. August 28th, 2005. And this is what he said, devastating damage expected. Hurricane Katrina, a most powerful hurricane with unprecedented strength, rivaling the intensity of Hurricane uh, Camille of 1969. And then he went on, most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer. At least one half of well-constructed homes will have roof and wall failure. All gabled roofs will fail, leaving those homes severely damaged or destroyed. He went on and talked about how all the trees will either be knocked down or at least all the greenery will be blown off of the trees and stuff like that. This guy was dead on, spot on on his prediction. Meanwhile, the news agency says, this guy's a, you know, a, a, prepare, a, a, a purveyor of doom. This is a guy that is a little wacko. Uh, we don't like his report, but everything he said came to pass. By the way, if you go to New Orleans today, there's still entire neighborhoods that are still uh, uninhabitable because of Hurricane Katrina. And it happened way back there in, what was that, 2005. So this guy nailed it and they call him the lone forecaster. That's what they called him. He got that nickname, the lone forecaster. He just retired last year um, as the lone forecaster that got Katrina right. As it turns out, our prophet Ezekiel, he's that guy. He's the lone forecaster in the Bible really that's gonna talk about this invasion uh, into Israel in the last days by a confederation of nations that it's gonna mark and be a sign of the last days that are to come. So that's what I wanna do. Let's cover the who, what, when, where, and why, and how. Uh, all these uh, you know, questions about what's this Ezekiel 38 prophecy. Sometimes people call it the Gog Magog uh, prophecy. Uh, why? Well, it's, it's about the who. First of all, let's look at the who uh, that is of this prophecy. There are nations that are listed here that are gonna be involved. And let's take a look, it's, it's, it's chapter 38, right here in verse one. It says, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, set thy face 
against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even with a great company of bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And then along with them, verse five, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, and with a shield and the helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Torgarma uh, of the north uh, quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Here we have a description of the who in this narrative of this, this battle of Gog and Magog. And the things that we need to understand is, um, you know, this is telling us about um, a, starting with a person. It says there in verse one, or verse two, son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog. Understand that Gog is the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. So there's gonna be in this Gog-Magog invasion, a leader, as he's called here, Gog. As it turns out, Gog is an interesting word in the Bible. The word Gog, it, it, it's a person, um, but it's also a title. Uh, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. That's what this is talking about. So who is this, this Gog individual? By the way, the, the, the name Gog is a title, kind of like Pharaoh was to the Egyptians. There were a bunch of Pharaohs that came and went. And uh, there's a bunch of those in the Bible of guys that had this sort of a title of the king. And that's the case here with the, the Megogites. Who are the Megogites? Well, we'll go into this on Wednesday in detail. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time telling you why today, why we know these nations are modern day nations. Um, we know who they are because of, um, interestingly enough, in Genesis chapter 10, there's the table of nations. And the table of nations kind of follows the descendants all the way from you know, um, you know, Noah down through the generations. And we know who the Magogites were and where they were in the world. And you know, we're gonna see that they, became, they came from the Scythian people, uh, as it turns out. But the, the people of Gog, as it turns out, are people, what we would say, are from Russia, maybe even more clearly from the former Soviet Union, if you remember that landmass. Um, that's largely the land of Gog and Magog of ancient Bible times. Um, now, so it's interesting, I gotta say, we have a lot of Russians in our church. Uh, so um, it's something to be thinking about. Like, this is an interesting thing for us to, to realize that, um, you know, you think, well, Brett, I don't know if I like you talking about, you know, my mother country this way. Well, you gotta also remember the United States plays a role in this and it's even more embarrassing in some ways. Uh, <laughs> like these nations uh, in the last days, a lot of the nations end up in real failure um, this is gonna be a situation that's gonna be brutal for Gog, Magog. Uh, it's just what the Bible says. So you've got this, this Gog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. If you follow the history, and again, we might look at this more on Wednesday night, but Rosh, talked about as Russia, not because of the word Rosh, by the way. Some people think, oh, you think it sounds like Russia, so you're calling it Rosh. Well, that's not why we, did, we believe that. Uh, because there's actually several names between when it was called Rosh versus when it became Russia, and it has nothing to do with the sound of the word. The reason I say that is because some people say, oh, you just think it's Russia because it says Rush. Now, different than that though, Meshach is probably Moscow, um, the city, uh, ancient times though. Um, now, some say it's parts of ancient Turkey. I put that under there because it depends on which uh, you know, people you're talking to, there's some, there's some debate on where Meshach is, but most scholars agree it's probably Moscow. Tubal speaks of the region of Tubolsk in Russia. And again, there's a secondary group that says it's part of modern day Turkey. We know that Turkey is gonna be part of this thing uh, no matter what, but uh, these definitions are, are tricky, but largely the uh, agreement is Russia is Magog, um, uh, along with all of the former Soviet states and that whole region of the world. Now these other nations, the, the list there that goes on in verse five, Persia, we know that to be Iran. It was per Persia all the way up to, what was it, 1935, I believe, is when Persia became the Islamic Republic you know, of Iran. Actually, it was Islamic Republic uh, there in the 70s, but, but um, it's been Iran since the 30s. Um, Kush is Sudan and Ethiopia. Put, uh, and, and by the way, these are spelled differently depending on which translation of the Bible you have. Don't be shaken by that. Uh, but these places, Put is Libya, 
Um, and um, it's actually, because the Bible times uh, borders were different, it also includes parts of Algeria and Tunisia uh, in that Northern Africa region there. That's all of Cush. Uh, um, uh, pardon me, of, of Put, I should say. Gomer was a guy on the Andy Griffith show, but uh, <laughs> as it turns out, he's also uh, a, a name, another name, an ancient name for the, the country of Turkey. And then you've got Bet Torgarma, which is Armenia, uh, Turkish speaking, speaking people that lived in that Central Asia region. Now that's a really fast description of these nations and people groups. But these are the players. You got uh, all the former Soviet and Russia area, plus Iran, Kush, Put, Gomer, Metzogarma. These are all the nations involved. But one of the things that seems to be implied in the Gog-Magog invasion is that the three main players are Russia, Iran, and Turkey, those are the big ones. And uh, we see that in this, in this narrative and we'll see that on, on uh, Wednesday night. So that's the who, uh, those are the nations, the confederation of nations. Um, but then it brings us to the what, what's gonna go on? Well, it's gonna be a storm. But what kind of storm? Well, we look back at our text that we read in verse uh, chapter 38. If you go you know, forward to verse, verse nine there, it says, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm the ascend, um, coming down from the north, ascending like a storm. Um, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and uh, many people with thee. So this army, this confederation of nations is gonna come down from the north and they're gonna come into Israel to do their deeds, uh, military. It's like a storm as it's, as it's called. Now in chapter 38, Look uh, back up to what we read earlier, verse four. Um, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws and I will bring thee forth and all your army with horses and horsemen. Um, now you say, Brent, who rides horses anymore? Come on. Um, what's the Bible saying? That Russia is gonna come down with horses? Uh, I'm not really saying that. I'll, I'll tell you, it is interesting. There's one army that still has a mounted cavalry uh, and that's Russia. They still do, uh, along with their regular army too, of course. But um, that is interesting. Some people argue there's gonna be some kind of a uh, electromagnetic pulse weapon that will disable all technology. And so they'll be back to riding horses. I don't know about that, that that's possible. But more than making that argument, I do wanna let you know, when you look at the original Hebrew translation of this verse, which is always helpful, one of the things you realize is the translation that we have, there was a bias that was superimposed over this verse. And I think it's important um, because we have horses and horsemen and we got bucklers with shields and handling swords. So we're all picturing like medieval knights coming and going to battle. Brad, is that gonna happen in modern day? Well, if you look at the original Hebrew text, it's not that specific that it's horses, bows and arrows and, uh, and swords and shields. It's not that specific. It's actually quite mysterious what Ezekiel says. And I'm gonna paraphrase, he says stuff like this. If you look at the Hebrew text, it says something more like, their army will come very rapidly riding on very fast things. That's what it says. It doesn't say they're riding on horses. Now in 1611, when the King Jimmy was translated, the King James, um, the translators in 1611 said, well, they're riding very fast things, so that must be horses. So they're riding horses and they have horsemen and they had weapons in their hands. Oh, that must be swords, because we know that in 1611, still having you know, swords is kind of the thing. So the translators sort of put in a, a twist on this that's actually not in the original text. Ezekiel saying stuff like these armies are gonna come rapidly down riding on very swift things. And having, and, and it's not just weapons in their hands. The, you might say the Hebrew implies that there's kind of an inventive nature of the weaponry that they're gonna be carrying. New weapons is the idea there. I believe that Ezekiel is seeing this vision of the Gog-Magog war and he's seeing modern day technology. <laughs> Can you imagine being a Bible guy trying to explain modern day technology? Um, I, I wonder what John the apostle, when he gives the book of Revelation and he's describing the last day's uh, warfare, uh, the verse, what is it? Revelation chapter um, nine, verse seven says, the shapes of the locust, talking about this battle, there's these big locusts that fly in and they come like horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the face of men. It even goes on later and says that their tails were like the sting of a scorpion and fire came out their nostrils. 
Now, if I'm John and I see a Apache helicopter, just say, I think there's a giant locust and it's got a crown on top that's amazing. And look at, there's faces of men inside there and there's flames coming out their nostrils. Um, like, how does John explain that? I don't know. And I'm not saying for sure that's what John's seeing here, but these Bible guys had a tough task. It's hard enough to explain weaponry even right now to people that know what it is. For example, I, um, I, I'm always impressed by tank technology. Um, when we go to Israel, uh, one of the things I try to do is I stop by a tank base. There's a tank base in Israel called Latrun. Now, the reason I stop there is, is actually fairly simple. Um, we have to appease a lot of the people in our group that like to shop. Um, so we go shopping and uh, half the group loves it, the other half doesn't. I'm not gonna say which half. Um, <laughs> so there's a group that's just kind of standing out while everybody else is shopping. But um, I sort of get back at the group that loves to shop by taking the, the other group to a tank base where you can play with weapons. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an amazing base there at Latrun. It's where some actually major tank battles have taken place in history, but here's Pastor Gabe and me uh, uh, with a bunch of the Israeli tanks in the background. It's kind of interesting, but um, here's, here's Brooke and Joe playing on a... <laughs> this is liter literally a Makarva IV tank. Like this is a highly advanced uh, tank. Uh, and here's Joey just kind of taking a... <laughs> take a little nap on the, on the, the gun. But, um, but you say, why do you do this? Well, like just the technology. Can you imagine like Ezekiel seeing something like this coming? Uh, you say, what is that? Well, it's a big green thing um, made out of something like metal. Like how do, how do you even describe this? Uh, when I was at this base, I asked one of the uh, tank commanders, I said, man, this Mercury 4 is a pretty amazing technology. He said, oh yeah. And I said, is the American tank, you know, like, are, can, can we hang with this tank? And he says, oh, you know, he's being real polite. Yeah, American tanks are, are great. Um, and, and he even explained how we share tank technology between our countries, which is really cool. But, uh, but he said, but you know, this Mercury 4, we've got a few additional things we've added that are kind of amazing. And I'm like, well, he said, well, come here. And he took, us, took a couple of us back into this uh, place and we watched this, he showed us this video of this very tank in action. And it was I walked away and I was like uh, weak in the knees after seeing this thing. It's hard to even explain. This tank is flying through the desert at rapid speeds. I don't know how fast it was going, but it was fast enough when it would go over these bumps, it would catch like two or three feet of air. Now, when you're looking at the tank, it looks like this huge, heavy hunk of metal. To think that it's going fast through the desert and catching big air, but even more amazing, this tank in this, in this video, it shows it catching air and while it's in the air, it goes in slow motion. The turret turns and fires before it even hits the ground. And whatever it was shooting at was 20 miles away and it hit the target perfectly while it was shooting, flying in the air. I was like, wow. Like, how do you describe that from a Bible guy's perspective? Um, a big frog with an elephant snout that fire comes out of. Like, what do you do? Okay, so the reason I share that with you is, is, you know, when we talk about the what is going on, the storm that Ezekiel talks about, he says there's a storm coming, he's the lone forecaster, but he says there's a storm coming, but it's gonna be a storm of weapons and it's a military that's gonna come like a dark cloud from the north and come into well, well, where? Well, that brings our next question of the day. Where is all this gonna happen? Well, it's gonna be in the Middle East, but more specifically, as we, I, I wanna get your brain kind of wrapped around the scenario here. We've got the Middle East here, but that little yellow spot there is Israel, the nation uh, that we're always talking about. It's amazing to, to me because Israel's the size of New Jersey. It's a tiny speck. I've talked to you about how small Israel is and the, the news you know, that you watch in America acts like you know, the poor little Arabs with their tiny little lands, the Israelis are taking over all the Arab lands, um, which is ridiculous um, because that's not even close to true. <laughs> the Arab lands, it's, it's giant. In fact, if you, if you kind of look at all the Arab lands, you realize they've done the math on this. If you take all the Arab countries in the world and put their land together and make it represented by the size of a, of a football field, one square foot of the football field is Israel. The rest of the football field is all the Arab lands. Are the Jews taking over all the Arab lands? No. Um, Israel's a tiny speck in the Middle East, but that, by the way, is the epicenter of all things Bible prophecy. 
And this Ezekiel 38 prophecy that we're about to kind of unfold, um, it has to do with these confederation of nations that are gonna come from the north and they're gonna attack Israel. What are these hostile nations? Let's, let, let's kind of explore this. The first attacker is, I've already said, Russia and the former Soviet Union. They're part of this confederation. Then you also have um, Iran uh, as part of that. We, we talked about that, remember Persia. But as I bring this together, let me ask you this. When did the Iranians or the Persians throughout history link up with the Russians or the Gog Magogites or the Scythians? When did they all align themselves and serve together? Anybody? Never. Uh, in fact, not even close. They were not friends. They never worked together. That's why this prophecy is important because here's Ezekiel saying that the ancient you know, Magogites, the Russians, are gonna align themselves with Iran in modern days. And in the last you know, 15 years, we've seen the Iranians and the Russians become close you know, compadres. The Russians are selling weapons to the Iranians. Uh, they have a lot of Russian weapons that the Iranians use. And they're even making um, deals even as we speak, the Russians and the Iranians, which is part of this posturing that goes on. You also have as players uh, that are attackers of Israel in the, in the Ezekiel 38 prophecies, Libya and Ethiopia. They're minor players, but they are players nonetheless. We've got, you know, Sudan. And you say, what about the Abraham Accords, Brett? We'll, we'll maybe touch on that Wednesday night. Uh, um, but, but all that to say, we've got um, Turkey, um, the main players, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Those are the main, big three of all the, the uh, you know, attacking nations. So there you have it. These nations are gonna be attacking Israel in this storm that's coming. Now, interestingly, the Bible tells us there's some, there's some nations that are gonna stand by when this happens, and, and I'm gonna call them the protesting standby, uh, you know, or the, the, the bystanders, I should say. Uh, who are the nations that are gonna give a small protest and say, hey, what are you doing? But that's all they're gonna do. The first group is the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, the Bible says. How do I know that? Well, the verse here, and you can jot this down in your notes if you want, Ezekiel 38, verse 13. It says about this, after this group comes down to take a spoil, um, it says in verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, and that's uh, Saudi Arabia and some of the other nations on the southern tip of that peninsula, um, Sheba and Dedan, along with the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions, or it might be translated, all their young lions, um, there, thereof, and shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered a company to take a prey and carry away silver and gold and cattle and goods to take away a spoil? But that's all they're gonna do. They're gonna say, hey, what are you doing? The protesting bystanders, Saudi Arabia, and when it says Sheba and Dedan, it includes all those southern tips nations of the peninsula there, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Oman, and Yemen. They're gonna be all part of the protesting bystanders. Along with, where is Tarshish? Well, it says the merchants of Tarshish, the, the known world at that time, Tarshish was, was, might as well have been on the edge of the world in their mind. And these merchants would come from afar with their stuff from Tarshish. Where was Tarshish? Well, it was the edge of the known world at that time and it's known today as the United Kingdom or England. The Brits were Tarshish. Now, um, who are the young lions of the United Kingdom? Well, there's debate on that. Some say it's the United States uh, because we're sort of descendants of the Brits. You know, we remember the whole American Revolution and all that stuff. Um, well, th th they argue that the, the young lions of the, of the merchants of Tarshish are the United States. Well, why didn't they say America on there? Well, if you remember Ezekiel during that time, they didn't even know that part of the world existed uh, until you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. We, we didn't know, they didn't know that. So there's this mysterious thing that the merchants of Tarshish with their young lions, some would say the United States will be part of this protesting bystander group. I wouldn't die on that battlefield, by the way, saying it's for sure the United States, but it is interesting nonetheless. So. All the red nations are the attackers. The green nations are the protesting bystanders. But there's another group of nations I wanna just discuss for a minute. And this, this contributes to the, the, the days we're living. Because all these nations so far that I've mentioned, they're perfectly postured to do exactly what Ezekiel says. 
Today they are. By the way, I would even argue that maybe even last year it wouldn't have been perfectly postured. I'll tell you why. Because the United States being a protesting bystander, we probably wouldn't have done that under the Trump administration. Um, Trump, whether you like him or hate him, doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not making a political statement. Um, but I am saying Trump was one of the most pro-Israel presidents we've ever had. And if you don't believe me, just ask the Israelis. They're naming trains after Trump in Jerusalem. They're, they, they call it the Trump Heights now instead of the Golan Heights because Trump, uh, Trump declared the Golan Heights belongs to Israel. And the rest of the world said, well, you shouldn't say that, but he did. Um, and also that Jerusalem's the capital city of Israel. Like Trump was the biggest friend of Israel uh, maybe in, in the history of the United States, as it turns out, and again, not a political statement, just what happened. If you ask the Jews, who was the least favorable president toward the United States, they would say, or toward Israel, I should say, they would say Obama's administration. And, um, and, and it seems that the Biden administration is kind of following in the same uh, action as the Obama administration. And that is to say, you know what, Israel, oh yeah, they're our friends and we love them. They say that in word, but the Israelis know that the, um, those administrations are not real friendly toward Israel when it comes down to it. Now, um, which administration would be more of a protesting bystander if somebody came and attacked Israel? Well, I, I think there's some administrations we'd go and fight with Israel but not this one. The Biden administration, it fits perfectly to the T. If, if Israel was attacked, it seems like what they would do is say, that's just, what a shame. Uh, you guys shouldn't have, a, Russia, Iran, Turkey, you guys shouldn't have done that. Um, and that's probably the way it would be handled right now. So the point that I'm making is, is the players and the pieces for this are kind of perfectly in, in place. But what about the nations around here that are not even mentioned, like Jordan, for example. Jordan's not mentioned in this narrative. But it, it's interesting because guess who is a, in a, a peace agreement with Israel? The Jordanians. When I take our groups to Israel, we often cross the border from Israel into Jordan uh, because they're at peace with Israel. And, and uh, we can go and see Mount Nebo and Petra and Jarish and some of these great uh, archeological ruins in that part of the world. It's great. But as it turns out, the Jordanians are at peace with Israel and thus I think that makes sense that they're not mentioned in this attacking group or the neutral bystander group, along with Egypt. Egypt and the Israel war up until about 25 years ago, they had a peace treaty and it's worked out and held up for quite some time. So it makes sense that Egypt is not part of this discussion. Um, uh, as it turns out also, Syria. Now you say, Brett, Syria is a crazy place and they seem like they might be hostile toward Israel. Yes, but not as much as far as Syria goes. Who's the leader of Syria? Well, you might say, well, it's Bashar Assad. He's the leader of Syria. But if you know the geopolitics of that part of the world, he's only a puppet. Who's really controlling Syria right now? Well, it's not the United States. We have a tiny remnant of our military, just a tiny bit there, almost not even mentionable. But who's got the greatest presence uh, and who's really controlling, who's pulling the strings in Syria? It's three main groups, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Like this is an amazing thing. The very main uh, north, the, the people that are gonna come from the north and attack from the north, guess where their armies are right now? They're right on the northern border of Israel, that yellow little northern part called the Golan Heights. That's that little nub at the top of Israel that's linked to Syria there. Um, have you heard in the news that the Israelis every couple of weeks are putting rockets over into Damascus, which is right on the other side of the border of Israel into Syria. Why are the Israelis rocketing that? The Iranians continue to build up weapons storages and, and the Jews are saying, we can't afford to have a nation that hates us and wants to demolish us, even their president saying, we wanna wipe Israel off the map. They can't afford to let those weapons be stashed there. So the Jews are bombing Damascus as we speak. And by the way, I won't even talk about it. Isaiah 17 prophecy that says that in the last days, Damascus is gonna be destroyed completely. Um, and I wonder if the Isaiah 17 prophecy is the sort of the, the trigger that starts the Gog Magog invasion. If Israel attacks Damascus and flattens it as a city, then Russia, Iran, Turkey, it would make perfect sense that they say, you can't do that. And we're gonna come down and take a spoil out of Israel. So Syria is not controlled by Syria right now. It's, it's, it's the civil war has destroyed Syria. Um, but the controlling factions that are there are the Russians, the Iranians, and Turkey. Uh, kind of interesting. 
Fits the narrative perfect. These days we're living, uh, the puzzle pieces are there. Now, Iraq's also not mentioned, um, but you might also say Iraq is largely, does anybody know who's starting to control Iraq more than anybody else? Anybody? Iran. Yeah, Iran is controlling Iraq, is starting to gain control in Iraq, which would also kind of take them out of the list if it's the Iranians. Who controls the Hezbollah up in Lebanon? Anybody? Iran. Iran fully funds the Hezbollah. It's Iran that controls, uh, and that's another reason why. I think Syria and, and, and uh, Lebanon are not mentioned because they're really uh, controlled by the Iranians um, and, so, um, and fully funded by the Iranians. Sad, both those countries are messed up. Lebanon used to be called the Riviera, like the French Riviera of the Middle East. It was one of the most beautiful countries in that whole region of the world. Um, but now it sits in total ruin because of the uh, Islamic jihadist uh, Hezbollah uh, funded by the Iranians. It's really kind of a sad story. So you got all these neutral, or I should say, um, you know, a bystand, consist, uh, conspicu- conspicuously absent nations. And so that's the playing field. And the reason I, I, I show you the maps of all this is the stage is perfectly set and there's never been a time in history where all these puzzle pieces have fit together perfectly. The Gog Magog invasion could happen today and nobody would even, like like they don't even have to do any massive military maneuvers and shifting of massive armies or anything like that. Everything's already kind of there. And and if this was to go, it wouldn't be a hard thing to make happen tomorrow. Um, So then that's the big question, when? Or we, we've got the who, all these confederation of nations attacking Israel. We got the what, it's a war that's gonna be coming down from these nations attacking the Jews in Israel. Um, uh, but then you've got the when, when is this gonna happen? Well, the scriptures tell us that it's gonna happen in the latter days. Um, where do we read that? It's Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 16. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud covers the land. It shall be in the latter days. That's the uh, Old Testament way of saying the end times or the end of the world. It's gonna be at that moment. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. By the way, if Russia attacked Israel today in this Gog-Magog invasion, uh, that would make Putin Gog, which is interesting. Is Putin a Gog-like character? Um, If you know Putin, uh, he's an impressive guy and he's held on to power for a long, long time. And he's also KGB, former KGB. So uh, he knows how to do stuff. But the implication is Gog is this impressive figure, but he, whoever that will be, whether it's Putin or some future Russian leader, um, the Lord says, I'm gonna gonna be sanctified in you. In other words, I'm gonna use you as an example. uh, to know that people will know right before their eyes that I am God. Um, boy, that's, that's something. Um, so, so it's gonna be the latter days. Now, what are some other things that are gonna be in the latter days? The rapture of the church, the tribulation period, ultimately the millennial kingdom will kick into gear in the latter days, according to the Bible. It's called a lot of things, the day of the Lord, stuff like that. Um, it's called a lot of things. So, so will the Gog-Magog invasion, the Ezekiel 38 invasion, will it be close to the rapture? That's the question, the rapture of the church. Because you see, as, as um, you know, there's a lot of different opinions on this, but as I read the Bible, it's pretty clear to me that um, the next thing on kind of the list of things to do is the rapture of the church. Um, you know, there's an eminence that the Bible requires for the rapture of the church. So we, we watch and wait for the rapture of the church. Um, so will this be close to the rapture? Now I'm gonna say something that's gonna be as clear as mud, but I, I'm, I'm gonna make a point here. Are you guys ready for this? I believe the Gog-Magog invasion is either gonna happen right before the rapture or the rapture's gonna happen during the Gog-Magog invasion or the rapture's gonna happen immediately following. <laughs> You're like, well, Brett, that's, that's not helpful. It is. What I'm not saying is that the rapture of the church is gonna happen 10 years before or 10 years after. The rapture of the church is gonna happen close to and very near the beginning of that war. Now, if you really pinned me down and you made me say, Brett, what do you really think? I believe as I read the Bible, and I'll, I'll go into some of these reasons maybe on Wednesday night. Um, we don't have time for all this but today, but, but I believe it's gonna be the rapture first, then right after the rapture of the church, then that Gog-Magog invasion will happen. 
And there's reasons I have for that. Um, uh, and uh, it's kind of hard to uh, articulate but uh, in this short time. But Ezekiel 39, verses 28 through 29 says, then they shall know that I am the Lord. What's the result of the Gog Magog invasion? At the end of chapter 39, this result is what should give you a clue about when all this is gonna take place. Because basically, if we're gonna read on Wednesday night that there's the Gog Magog invasion, then there's seven years of burning the weapons and cleaning up the land. Seven years after the Gog Magog invasion, seven years. And then at the end of that seven years, Ezekiel 39 uh, verse 28 says, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity. Who are we talking about there? Hello? Israel, they were the ones led into captivity. What is, what's gonna happen? The Jews are gonna know that it's God who did all this. We know from other scripture, that's gonna happen at the end of the tribulation period, the end of the seven year period called tribulation. So the Gog Magog invasion happens right at the beginning of the tribulation period, um, which I believe the rapture is gonna happen first, then this invasion. Then it says, they will know that I'm the Lord, which caused them to be led in captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them into their own land, have left none of them any more there, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. The reason that's important is here, you know, we sit, watching the geopolitics of, of all these nations perfectly postured. It's amazing to me, there's a lot of churches that won't even talk about this stuff. Um, it's a little bit like the lone forecaster of Katrina kind of said, hey, there's something really interesting and you might wanna know this is gonna happen, but the world just kind of said, oh uh, yeah, whatever. That's kind of what the church is doing, even though Ezekiel gave us all these little pieces to look at. And the Bible says, be vigilant and sober and watching and, and what have you. And these are the signs that we're really close to this Gog Magog invasion. It's, it's happening right in front of us as it turns out. Well, then that brings us to the, sort of the why. Why is all this gonna happen? Um, well, there's a couple reasons. It depends on your perspective. You know, the first why that is answered is, you know, why are the Russians and these confederations of nations gonna come down? Well, the, from God's perspective, he says, I'm gonna put hooks in your jaw and I'm gonna bring you down. I'm gonna bring you down to attack Israel. Um, it's almost like the nation, Russia and Iran and Turkey, they don't even have a say in the matter. God says, I'm gonna put hooks in your jaws and I'm gonna draw you down to attack Israel. So that's the first why. The second why, if you're, if you're a Russian, Iranian, or a person from Turkey during the Gog Magog, you think you're going to take a spoil. Um, if you take off the S and the P, I think that gets closer to what they're wanting to take. Um, you know, the, the Russians could use a fresh batch of oil and natural gas. Like, uh, like Israel has all kinds of natural resources um, and they're gonna come. They're gonna say, we're gonna go down there and take a spoil. That's their intention. They won't be able to do that, but that's what they're gonna wanna do. Um, and then thirdly there in Ezekiel 38, 23, thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. The whole reason for the Gog Magog invasion is for God to reveal himself and to step into the world and intervene. And he's gonna do that both with the Gog Magog invasion, but he's also gonna do that with the tribulation period. Um, have you ever had somebody say, well, if God is love, why doesn't he intervene in the world? And why doesn't he make all the wrongs right? If God is all powerful, why doesn't he do that? The answer is really simple, he will. It's gonna happen. And the Bible predicts when it will happen. We'll know the times and the seasons. You don't know the day or the hour. Any Bible prophecy person that tells you the day or the hour, hey, on May 17th, there's gonna be a this and that. Run for your life, that guy's been drinking his bath water. Um, <laughs> Don't, don't listen to that. We don't know the day nor the hour, but we will know the times and seasons, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you see, that leads us to the question, how is this gonna go down? How is this battle gonna be fought? Well, there's some scary evidence of how this battle's gonna go down. Um, uh, and that we read about in, uh, and I'm gonna just try to do this really quickly, but Ezekiel 39, verses one through 16 um, basically, we'll see on Wednesday night, it says that the, this massive army is gonna come down, but God is gonna smite this army. We're gonna go back to more biblically proportioned battles where God says, I'm gonna wipe. Remember when Rav Shaka, the trash talker from uh, the Syrians in the Bible, remember when 185,000 soldiers were slain by a, one angel at night? 
That happened in the Bible. That was a Bible story. Um, this is gonna be the similar deal. And Ezekiel chapter 39, in fact, let's just do a few um, high points. Verse two of chapter 39. I will turn thee back, the army, and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Where's this gonna ultimately go down? The West Bank. That's the mountains of Israel. And, and, and who, how much of the army is gonna be destroyed? He's gonna wipe out five-sixths of the army of this confederation army. One-sixth is gonna be able to go back. And um, how's it gonna go down? Check out uh, verse um, nine. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, and all the hand uh, staves, the spears, and all of them shall burn uh, with fire for how long? Seven years. They're gonna burn these weapons for seven years, the length of the tribulation. Um, and it gets even weirder. Now you tell me what you think is gonna happen. There's gonna be bodies strewn all over the West Bank, mountains of Israel. And then it explains how those bodies are gonna decompose and be buried. Are you wanna find out what's gonna happen with that? Um, we should have done this one in October. Um, it says here, verse 11, it shall come to pass, verse 11, in that day I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. In other words, the, if there's gonna be so much death, it'll stink up the land. Um, and um, it says, there shall, they shall bury Gog and his multitude, and they call it the valley of Haman Gog, or uh, the multitude of Gog is buried in this valley. That's the idea of the name. Now check this out, verse, seven, uh, verse 12, pardon me. It says, in seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them and it shall be to them a renown the day that I, the Lord, be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out of men, men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of the seven months, they shall search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when they see a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And uh, also the name of the city shall be Hamona. Uh, thus shall they cleanse the land. Now, um, what a weird situation that we've got there explaining, you know, how this is gonna go down. What does it seem to imply to you in modern day? I mean, the Bible people, they think, what is this thing where if you're walking through the valley of Hamangog and you see a bone, they're saying, don't touch it. Put a flag there and the professional full-time barriers will come and deal with those bones, but you are not supposed to touch that. What is that? What's that all about? Radioactivity is kind of the common thought which implies that maybe all these bodies strewn over the West Bank could be some kind of a nuclear detonation that wipes out these armies. Um, which if you know the Middle East and if you know the nuclear situation with Israel, with Russia, there's plenty of nukes to go around uh, in that region of the world. Not with Iran yet. They're getting close to nuclear weaponry, but not yet. So you say, okay, Brett, this, this is troubling. This bodies everywhere, radioactive burials and like this is biblical time predicting modern day warfare and what have you. So the big question is, is this, this battle sort of just quickly wiped out supernaturally where God just goes and wipes out you know, the whole army or is it a nuclear weapon? And that's where Ezekiel 39, 11 through 16 and we'll even show you more evidence of that um, when we get to uh, uh, Wednesday night. But I wanna kind of start to wrap this up because some of you are saying, Brett, this is kind of doom and gloom. Um, some of you are like, man, I have friends and family in Russia and are they gonna be part of this? And you know, what about this? Well, see, that's just the thing. When you're a citizen of heaven, when you're a Christian, guess what? All of this can be a comfort to you. How could it be a comfort to me? Well, for those that are believers, we're supposed to comfort one another because the rapture of the church takes us out. Uh, during these brutal last days. Um, you know, we're gonna be raptured. Now, some of you might say, Brett, I don't believe in the rapture. You're making that up. It's not even in the Bible. You'll hear churches say that stuff today. They'll say false teachers are teaching about the rapture. 
And they use very strong language like that. Um, I wouldn't call them false teachers, even though they don't teach the rapture. Um, I just say they're a little misguided. Um, it's an in-house debate about the rapture and the timing of all these events, and it shouldn't be something that divides the church. But um, the word rapture, I'll give it to them, it's not in your King James Bible. But it's not academically correct to say the rapture is not in the Bible because it's in the Latin Vulgate translation, and it's all about the word. It's here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the, the, the trump of God, don't confuse the trump of angels of the book of Revelation. Those are angels' trumps. This is a trump of God. And it says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And by the way, they are rising first. People who die today, they rise and go to heaven. To be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. So the dead in Christ shall rise first, and they are. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Uh, that Latin translation, rapture, uh, Greek, original text of the Greek, harpazo, which means to be caught up. Call it whatever you want. Being caught up, zipped, zinged, zippy to do I don't care what you want to call it, but it means you're going to be caught up, and it even explains it. You'll be caught up together with them, those that have gone on before us. <clears throat> we'll be meeting together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Is the rapture of the church a coming of the Lord? No. There's the first coming of the Lord. He came in Bethlehem in a manger, you know, that whole thing. The second coming of the Lord is the second coming at the end of the tribulation period where Christ puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives and goes to Basra and then the Battle of Armageddon and all that stuff. That's the second coming. It's gonna be a glorious coming. This is not a coming of the Lord. This is where we meet the Lord in the air, it says here. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. From that day forward, you and I as the church, when we're raptured, we're gonna be with the Lord from that day forward for all eternity. And what's good about that? It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture of the church is the most comforting thing it should be to the believer. If you're a Christian, you should be thinking, oh man, the rapture's the answer. And I've always said it, there's no problem I'm experiencing today that the rapture doesn't solve. The rapture of the church. Um, now, if you keep reading, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, it goes on and says this, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that in the day of the Lord, it'll so come as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, when who? Not us, the church. When they, the non-believers, shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape, but you, brethren, Christian church, you are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not in the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And he goes on, for they that sleep, sleep in the night as they that be drunk are drunk in the night. But let us, the Christians who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. This is what we're supposed to be doing, by the way, right now. Put on the breastplate of faith and love for, uh, and also for a helmet, the helmet, uh, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, or we're alive or dead, we should live together with him. Wherefore, again it says, second time, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, means to build each other up, even as also you do. The reason I read this long text from 1 Thessalonians is it says the rapture of the church is coming, it's gonna take us out. And it said, we are not appointed unto wrath. The tribulation period is called the time of the wrath of the lamb. That's what, one of the names of the tribulation. Does God put his bride through the wrath? No, he takes his bride out. You'll never see in the Bible, the Lord destroy the righteous with the wicked. And so the rapture of the church, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, is gonna happen, and we comfort one another knowing. And it says, you guys are not in the darkness. Why? Why is the church not in the darkness? And it says, the times and the seasons you will know. Because all throughout the Bible, we're given evidence about the days that will be the last days. Jesus gave it to us in Matthew 24 when the disciples said, you know, when's the end of the world? And, and Jesus gave a long, you know, red letter, four page edition of what the end of the world's gonna look like, like the days of Noah, earthquakes in diverse places, pestilence, which means, you know, uh, disease uh, and stuff like that. Uh, ethnicity against ethnicity, nation against nation. Like Jesus said, this is what the last days would look like. Those are signs of the times. 
But I would argue that Ezekiel 38 might just be one of the most underappreciated signs of the days we're living. As all those nations that I showed you are postured right now on the northern border of Israel to do exactly what Ezekiel 38 says. And that, that event's gonna be right when the rapture of the church happens. I believe we're right on the cusp of those days. Even the, the secular world says, man, things in the world are weird. And there's people sort of troubled. What's gonna happen in the world? Where's everything going? Where's this leading to? You know, all this you know, trouble and consternation among the nations, this vacuum of leadership all around the world. Um, what about these UFOs that people have seen, even our military documenting a couple of weeks ago that, yeah, we don't understand some of the, like what's gonna happen? I believe that the world is set for the Lord to do what he says in his word. Um, can you imagine the rapture of the church? Uh, what's that gonna do? Uh, some people will say, hey, my, my grandma told me about this rapture of the church. That's where they went. They were all raptured. Others will say, no, no, no. They were taken by UFOs. Because um, <laughs> that's what those are, or UFOs. And they, all those people disappeared. Um, the New Agers ha already have a narrative. You know what the New Agers say? They say, there's a whole group of people that are holding back the age of Aquarius. There's gonna be a massive disappearing and taking away. And some say it's the aliens who planted the seed of life on this earth. They're gonna remove all the problems. And when they're taken, then they'll enter into the new world of uh, age of Aquarius. That's gonna be one of the explanations, I think, for the rapture of the church, even though we know it has nothing to do with Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> it only has to do with Christ taking his church out of the world before his wrath is poured out on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. That's the way it's gonna go down. Um, man, these are days, that I'm, I'm really thankful I get to live in uh, the last days. I, I really do believe we're living in those days. Well, what if you're wrong, Brett? There's other people who said that for years and they were wrong. Put me in their category. I'm happy to be with, with uh, you know, Spurgeon and Zwigli and, and Tozer and, and some of the great, Paul the apostle and those guys, Peter, they believe the Lord could come back in their day. The early church even walked around saying, Maranatha, the Lord come quickly. They were hoping that the, the rapture of the church could happen in their time. And I think that's the point. If you're a Bible believing Christian, God wants you to live with that expectation and the anticipation of the rapture of the church. It just so happens you and I live in a day where it's undeniable that the end time scenario is postured. We're sitting right on the brink geopolitically and I think it's fascinating. Well, we'll cover this in greater detail. That was uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, 101. Um, but before we go, this is a comforting word if you're a Christian because you're gonna be taken into heaven and raptured and we get to be saved by God's grace. But if you're not a Christian, this should be a scary word. Um, and maybe you don't know all the theology of the Bible, but you sense that what I'm talking about is true. And you think, man, the Bible talks about all this stuff. And you've maybe missed the truth. And the truth is you're a sinner. And the Bible says we all are destined to hell, but God so loved the world, you and me so much that he sent his son, Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And anyone who will believe and say, I accept that gift of salvation. First, you got to repent and say, I, I'm a sinner and acknowledge your sin before God. Then you say, Lord, I believe that Jesus died for those sins, took my penalty, and I accept the gift of salvation. And the Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him up from the dead, it tells us there, you will be saved. Don't miss that. This is not a day to be alive and be messing around with faith, uh, playing games with God. This is not that time. It's time now to be serious about the Lord, to repent of your sins and be saved. In Jesus' name, let's pray together. If you would, just keep your heads bowed. I'd like to ask this question. Are you one who has never accepted Christ? If you ha haven't, today's a great day. You can just confess Jesus with your mouth, from your heart, and be saved, because he did all the work for you. And if that's you, I'd like to pray that prayer with you of confession. And I'm not gonna embarrass you, but with everybody else's head bowed, if you're saying, Brad, I wanna accept Christ, would you just look up and give me a quick wave? And I wanna acknowledge you, just you, me, and the Lord right now. Everybody else is kind of in prayer and stuff. But if that's you, I just wanna acknowledge you. Good, good, awesome. Let me look around. I see you right there, good. Don't let me miss you. Cool. Awesome. Way in the back, I see you, good. 
I'm gonna just pray this simple but powerful prayer. It's not the work we do that saves us, it's the work he did on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished. What was finished? The work of salvation for anyone who would believe. And you confessing right now that faith in what Christ did for you, that's what saves. So let's, I'm gonna ask the whole church to pray this out loud. We're gonna get behind these five or six people who are accepting Christ right now. We're gonna pray this with you, but let's pray it right to the Lord. He'll hear you, he'll honor this prayer of confession. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. That he rose up from the grave and that all my sins are forgiven. Help me to walk with you and thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, how thankful we are for so great a salvation. I pray for these people who've just acknowledged their desire to, to be saved. And Lord, we accept that glorious work you've done. We believe that you did it, that it's not of ourselves and it's not of our ability, but you saved us. So may you just cause each of these people to sense the great mercy and forgiveness of sin. May they know that they have a new start. May they know that when they sin in the future that you still love them and you still forgive them. And we can just quickly confess our sins and you're faithful and just to forgive us. But Lord, may your church, even these new believers today, but all of us, may we be watching and waiting, sober and vigilant in the days we're living. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. I've done it again. I went overtime. And so it's gonna be a traffic jam. I'm really sorry. You know what that's all about though. You know the routine. Uh, be, be nice to each other on the way out of the parking lot. We'll see you next time. God bless you, you're dismissed. <laughs>